Um, electrochemistry, you know, it's always kind of down on the wire to get electrochemistry in. Uh, I'm accustomed to doing it in five days and that's what I got scheduled for this. Um, so we're looking at two sections today. <coughs> Section one is actually like one side of one page. So it's not really kind of doing one section. Uh, then we'll take a look at some more of this. And this uh, 18 point, these, this first two days is the really meaty part of it. Not difficult, but just uh, where it's at. And then on Friday, we'll be uh, looking at two sections. Uh, Nothing too fancy about that. We don't have school on Monday. We finish up the last section on Tuesday, which means we have tests on Wednesday. So that's a normal pace for doing this. We're not we're not like rushing it or trying to cram it in any faster than we normally do. Um, but next week is a doozy. You know, I'll just kind of scroll down here. It starts here by saying test tomorrow, test tomorrow, test tomorrow. Just just all next week. Just think there's a test tomorrow. Until you get to uh, Friday, then no test tomorrow. I'm thinking with the AP final, we'll do the uh, three response the first day. This that was a tougher part to grade for me, so it takes more time to get it done. Uh, and then we'll finish it up with the uh, faster and easier multiple choice part on the second day. Mr. Hart, uh, you know, uh, there's actually less grading. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Yeah. That's my comment. Oh, crap. Who's grading this tsunami of paperwork? I always ask myself that at the end. <laughs> yeah. I'll try it. And then we take the test on Thursday and we have a Sunday on Friday. How is that? Sunday, Fridays. Yeah, exactly. We should yeah, start that next important. year in AP Chemistry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't even get combustion data honors chemistry this year. I know. I know. Yeah. That's what I was saying. I was like, if the school can burn down, it's not because that day went haywire. I'm gonna be upset. I know. I know. I was actually looking around like, did I do something wrong? <laughs> I was in the room alone, and I'm, I, I walked out, and I'm like, okay, I guess we got a fire. And then I was saying there the time I was out there, I'm like, was there a fire in the back room? And I just didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> Wasn't me. Um, that was chilly. All right. Um, this is where it all begins. I was just going to go. And how to begin. Before that, before that. There it is. So we're all talking about electrochemistry in this chapter. I like this chapter because it's that, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, that's how that works, kind of a chapter. Electrochemistry constitutes one of the most important interfaces between chemistry and everyday life. Every time you start your car, turn on your calculator, listen to your whatever device, or text your friends, you're depending on electrochemical reactions. Electrochemistry is best defined as the study of the interchange of chemical and electrical energy. It is primarily concerned with two processes that involve oxidation and reduction. Those two processes that they're talking about would one be those that generate an electric current from a spontaneous chemical reaction. And those are known as Galvanic cells or they're often referred to as voltaic cells. You know them better as batteries. Whether they're, they're galvanic or voltaic, they're essentially a battery. 
And of course, we want our batteries to produce an electric current. In contrast to that, we also have something in which electrical energy is used to bring about, bring about a non-spontaneous reaction. And those are known as electrolytic cells. So using electricity to make a reaction that would not otherwise happen, happen. We spend about 80% of our time talking about the first one and our last section is talking about the last one, electrolytic cells. So because it is a redox topic, uh, we have to just do a little brush up page here before we get into it. You might remember Leo Gurr and Oily Riggy. Um, losing electrons is what oxidation is. That's where your electric current begins or if the electrons are being given off. Um, or we could say oxidation Same thing. Um, the opposite of that, meaning electrons is reduction. reduction. So electrons are produced at one end of a reaction, they're pulled in at the other end of the reaction and oxidation and reduction have to occur together. So uh, we have to know both of them. Just to kind of review a little bit of what we did back in chapter four, and I know it's a long time ago. Um, looking at a, balanced electrochemical cell here. One of the first things that we did is we went through and looked at um, the oxidation numbers that went with each of the individual elements. Ions by themselves, uh, single atom ions or monatomic ions, their oxidation numbers, whatever their charge is. In a polyatomic ion, all the oxidation states of the elements have to add up to what the charge of the polyatomic ion is. And we used certain ones that we're confident with, like oxygen being negative two, giving us eight negatives, to figure out the ones that we are less confident with. And plus seven minus eight adds up to negative one, the charge of the atom. This is two, this is plus two, this is plus three, and H2O is plus one, and negative two. Then we look in the reaction to figure out who's oxidizing and who's reducing. And when you're oxidizing, your oxidation state or your oxidation number is increasing. And when you're reducing, it's decreasing. So for our oxidation in this case, we look at them and you can have more than one thing oxidizing. Usually there's one thing though. In this case, our oxidation is the iron going from two to three. And there's got to be something reducing as well. Otherwise, the reaction wouldn't have its partner. And the manganese is reducing here. Not everything has to oxidize and reduce, but there's got to be at least one oxidation and one reduction going on. So in this reaction, we would say the iron plus two is oxidized. And the MnO4 is reduced, specifically the manganese in that. Electrons are transferred from the iron, which is known as 
the reducing agent the thing that is oxidized helps reduction take place that's where the agent part comes in if you're you oxidize you're helping reduction so you are re also known as a reducing agent it's kind of backwards thinking and uh the MnO4, which is reduced, is acting like the oxidizing agent. It is helping oxidation take place. The college board, I mentioned this back when we did this in chapter four. The college board said they're not going to use the terms reducing agent and oxidizing agent because it gets people spun around in their thinking. But unfortunately, your textbook author, author doesn't align itself with the uh, college board thinking on this. So I even put on your assignment at the bottom of the page, just a reminder, oxidizing agent means this, reducing agent means this. So when you see it in the assignment, you know that it's just talking about who's helping oxidation take place and who's helping reduction take place. I'm not gonna try to trick you on those terms either. It is useful to break a redox reaction into two half reactions, one involving oxidation and one involving reduction. For the reaction above, the half equations could be written something like this. For the oxidizing iron, we would say we've got Fe plus two going to Fe plus three. And oxidation involves losing electrons, and in this case, one electron is given off to go from a plus two charge to a plus three charge. In terms of reduction, we've got MnO4. And uh, let me give myself lots of space for this one. It's eventually going to get itself down to Mn plus two. In order to balance this, we have the freedom to bring in hydrogen ions and water molecules as needed to help us balance it. So I notice the manganese doing the reduction from plus seven to plus two. And I look at this and I'm like, I got oxygens over here. I need oxygens over there. Water is where I'm gonna get my oxygens from. But because I put four waters over there to get four oxygens, I have to put eight hydrogens over here. And then I also have to think about the electrons involved. How many electrons are being gained? And to go from uh, plus seven to plus two, the difference is five, five electrons that were gained in that half equation. One other thing we would typically do at this point before we would add them together and get our balanced equation, we would uh, make sure that the number of electrons oxidized is equal to the number of electrons gained. So we might have to multiply everything in the oxidation half reaction by a factor of five. So that uh, electrons gained to electrons lost. And then at that point, we'd be able to uh, combine them together and get our balanced half equation or overall equation. We tend to work in the half equation format more than we do the whole balanced equation in this chapter. Actually, the redox that we do in this chapter, as far as the redox reactions go, are easier than what you had to do back in chapter four. Mostly we're working in this part. Goes on to say that when the permanganate ion and the iron plus two ion are present in the same solution, the electrons are transferred directly when the reactants collide. So they bump into each other, one loses electrons, one gains electrons. Under these conditions, no useful work is obtained from the chemical energy involved in the reaction, which instead is released as heat. 
So the question is, how can we harness the energy of this spontaneous redox reaction? How can we make the reaction provide useful work? How can we get those electrons doing something for us that's useful? And that's where we pick it up in section 18.2, where we look at galvanic cells. This is going to be a little story of an ox and a red cat. And it goes with your oil and your rig or your Leo and your Jur. Throwing an ox and a red cat, and you're halfway there. The oxidation reduction reaction taking place in an electrochemical cell involves two electrodes. At one electrode, which we will call the anode, an oxidation half reaction occurs. Electrons are being produced at the anode. For example, you might have zinc metal going to the zinc plus two ion, releasing two electrons, which with every time that reaction takes place. At the other end, which we will call the cathode, a reduction half re reaction occurs. Electrons are being consumed. The ones that are released by the oxidation are being consumed as reduction involves gaining. For example, we might have copper plus two ions acquiring two electrons and going back to being neutral copper at the other end of the reaction. So, the anode is where oxidation takes place. And the red cat reduction is where the cathode is. You just want to make sure your cathode and your anode don't get turned around. Right now. Notice that the number of electrons produced at the anode is exactly equal to the number of electrons consumed at the cathode because oxidation has to occur with reduction in place. Uh, this one just happens to be already balanced at two and two. We don't need any coefficients to get there. In principle, any spontaneous redox reaction can serve as a source of energy in galvanic cells. The cell must be designed in such a way that oxidation occurs at one electrode, the anode, with reduction at the other electrode, the cathode. The electrons produced at the anode must be transferred to the cathode where they are consumed. To do this, the electrons move through an external circuit where they will do electrical work. So that's the goal is we want to be able to harness the energy of those electrons being transferred so it can power our devices. The key to harnessing the energy of the chemical reaction is to separate the oxidizing agent from the reducing agent. Separate, separate the one that's reducing from the one that's oxidizing. Thus requiring the electrons transfer to occur through a wire. However, just connecting the two electrons with the wire is enough, not enough to establish a continuous electrical flow. For a moment, the current would flow like milliseconds, and then it would stop because the charge build up in the two, because of a charge buildup in the two compartments. Continue to continue, the charge buildup requires too much work and the reaction stops. So the idea is you would put your oxidizing half equation in one beaker, you're reducing half equation in another beaker, and you'd want the electrons to transfer through the wire. But that in itself doesn't complete the circuit. It causes too much charge buildup. 
and the reaction stops almost instantly. Too much work to keep it going in that format. So there's another component that has to be worked into this. And that's gonna be something we call a salt bridge. This problem of that charge buildup is easily solved. The solutions must be connected so that ions can flow to keep the net charge of each compartment zero. This connection might be, this connection might involve a salt bridge or a porous disc, which is a piece of ceramic. This is actually essentially the same thing. Uh, a piece of ceramic that is not glazed, so it's not shiny or glossy. It's you know basically clay. And uh, turns out that when it's soaked in a water environment, ions can actually slowly, but they can move back and forth between these to allow you to keep the charge balanced. I'll demonstrate that working in just a minute. But a salt bridge will work, and I'll demonstrate that as well. Or you can use a piece of ceramic or a porous disc. Either allows ions to flow without excessive mixing of solutions. That's what we're really trying to do is we want them to react with each other, but we don't want to react all at once. We want to get all those electrons doing work for us before they kind of poop out and the battery goes dead. So we're trying to minimize that excessive mixing. The ion flow makes the circuit complete. Electrons flow through the wire, moving from the reducing agent, which is where the oxidation is, um, over to the oxidizing agent where the reduction takes place. And the ions flow from one compartment to the other, keeping the net charge of the circuit zero. So let me... Um, We'll that diagram a little bit more closely here. So let's say this is where the oxidation is taking place, um, which means we're losing electrons. Electrons would be lost as there's an exchange between the the electrode here and the solution here. And as the electrons are lost, those electrons are going to move their way through the wire over to this side where reduction is taking place. And they have gained the electrons. Without the salt bridge, though, we get these charge buildups and things would stop pretty quickly. So the salt bridge allows for things to uh, balance each other out. So what we're going to find is that the, I think I want to color code this in one way or another. Let's do this way. What we're going to find is anions. move across the salt bridge towards the anode. That way the anode. Cathode. And uh, the cations Positive ions move their way over to the cathode. So you still need some uh, ions interacting with each other to keep this going forward. That's the basic setup of pretty much any voltaic or galvanic cell. Uh, just a little note here at the bottom. If the solutions mix, if you just dumped one into the other, for example, or if this, we'll just say if you dumped one into the other, uh, if they were to mix, the reaction starts out. Instead of having the electrons go through the wire, just be lost as heat, and the reaction would come to an end pretty quickly. 
When mixed, electron transfer, electron transfer takes place directly between the oxidizing and reducing agents and not through the wire and the reaction comes to a quick end. Uh, this is the same diagram taking place, but you're using a porous disc between the two. So if you have a glassware that's specially designed for this, you got your two beakers with this connection, glass connection point in between, and they insert a porous ceramic disc between them where those uh, ions can transfer back and forth, the cations and the anions, without, uh, without the two solutions mixing very quickly. Um, so that's a little bit more sophisticated. I don't have any of those, but I can show you the equivalent of that with what I got. Um, so electrons always being produced at the anode and consumed at the cathode. Probably like 90% of my diagrams put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right every time. Just that's what they mostly do. But you always should check it out and make sure you're confident that the anode's on the left and the cathode's on the right. But sometimes they switch around just to see if you're paying attention. Um, this is what's oxidized. Oxidized is the thing that helps reduction take place. So they use that term reducing agent there. This is one being reduced, which if you're reducing, you're helping oxidation take place. So you're called the, reduce, the, the oxidizing agent. Um, every time you see agent, they're referring to the opposite function. I want to show you a cell, and that's the one I can demonstrate. Um, Kind of going back to that zinc and copper that they were mentioning on the previous page, we're going to look at a zinc copper cell and see if we can make a battery out of that. When a piece of zinc is added to a water solution containing copper plus two ions, the following redox reaction takes place. You'll notice that the zinc is going from zero to plus two, it's oxidizing. Copper is going from plus two to zero, so it is reducing. In this reaction, the copper metal plates out on the surface of the zinc, and the blue color of the aqueous copper plus two solution fades as it is replaced by the color, colorless zinc plus two ion. The reaction is spontaneous as it, in, as it involved the transfer of electrons from zinc the metal to zinc or to the copper plus two ion. To design this galvanic cell using the zinc copper ion reaction as a source of electrical energy, the electron transfer must occur indirectly. That is, the electrons given off by the zinc atoms must be made pa to pass through an external circuit, a wire, before they reduce the copper plus two ions in the copper atoms. The galvanic cell that I'm going to make here consists of two, uh, two half cells, two half cells, which go along with the half, the half uh, equations. First, we're going to have a zinc anode dipped in a solution of zinc ions, and then we're going to have a copper cathode dipped in a solution of copper plus two ions. I'm filming that right yeah. here. Water, Water. copper metal, zinc metal for my, my uh, electrodes. Let's see. So it'd be easier for you to see if I kept it the copper on the right, your right. So copper over here. So I am not going to. Um, To measure this. Uh, what I'm trying to do is get a one molar solution of copper sulfate, you know, roughly, uh, 
because that would be standard conditions and all that kind of stuff. But um, I'm going to use copper sulfate as my source to bring in the copper plus two ions. I could have also used copper two chloride, which I've done in the past, because that would also bring in that. Or I could use copper nitrate to bring in the copper plus two ion. I just need a delivery system for the copper plus two, and I'm using copper sulfate for that. I'll put some of that in there. That seems like a bottom mole. Then I'm going to add some water to that, get that dissolving. That seems like a liter. So that's a one molar solution. And then uh, I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to do some zinc sulfate. Tell me when I got a mole. That's good. Thank you. Good eye, good eye. Add a liter of water to a 300 milliliter beaker. Good. And then I'll just use that as my stirring rod. Kind of put the copper in the copper ions and the zinc into the zinc ions. I got my half cells ready to go. Um, The external circuit consists of a voltmeter connected to the wire carrying the flow of the electrons. Copy out of the way. <clears throat> so for my voltmeter, where is it? I got this. This. Um, we'll make this go here. Stay. It's going to spring and it doesn't spring anymore. That broke it. Get that to stick to that. And all we have to do is touch, but it'd be nice if they would just stay there. now. Let's get back it off. And I'm going to connect this one over here. This one hasn't spring on it yet, so it should work. That one stays. Go back in here. All right. So now, we got our wire going through, and that is connected to a voltmeter, which is connected to the Logger Pro. So I can just kind of do this, hopefully. And I can see uh, what kind of voltage we have coming off that, and that is no voltage. It's just that when I zero this thing, it uh, zeroes out at about there. Too many sig figs here. If I knock it down to the hundredth place, we wouldn't be fluctuating very much. So we're at zero volts right now. We don't have any voltage being produced. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to add a salt bridge because I got to keep these two compartments electrically neutral. And right now, um, 
a couple of electrons were transferred from one side to the other. It built up a little bit of charge and it stopped the reaction from continuing. So I need a salt bridge to go between those two. I can be fancy or unfancy with this. I don't know. Move this way. Take a piece of paper towel, make a strip out of it. Um, I'm going to make it fancy. Another beaker in the middle. And I'm going to add salt to that. literal sodium chloride. Add a little water to the salt. I'm just trying to make it difficult for this chamber to react with this chamber. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this, make this all salty. Get that all salty, get this all salty. Connect my electrode again so we can see what's happening. Still nothing happening because we don't have our salt bridge in here. So watch this. I'm going to make the cations from this side go over here into the middle chamber. And I'll take the anions from this side, give them an opportunity to go into the center chamber. So they can basically go back and forth between the two. And as soon as I drop this in here, we start producing the voltage because we completed the circuit. 1.07. Pretty close to what it was supposed to be, according to the diagram, 1.1. I'll take that off by three hundredths of a volt. Obviously, my molarities were almost perfect. Um, so we got a battery going right now, and this is going to produce electricity. And because they got a lot of reactants and a lot of um, in both half cells, I got plenty of salt bridge here, and I got a lot of solution. I got pretty thick metal electrodes and stuff. This battery would probably go for days uh, without losing any voltage. Pretty uh, big battery, actually. Oh, oh no, that. No, no. We can collect data on that too. Like send the battery. Battery. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's take this back for a second and explain what's going on here a little bit more carefully. This is a great starting example because it's pretty easy to follow. There's not a lot of like extra stuff going on with it. So at the anode where electrons are being produced here at the zinc, um, we got zinc one and zinc plus two and that involves losing two electrons. When you lose two electrons, the zinc metal becomes a zinc ion and goes into solution with the other zinc ions that are already there. Um, so you're actually, as the reaction is taking place, deteriorating the, the uh, anode, the electrode where the zinc is. The zinc is actually dissolving away and gradually becoming zinc ions as it releases two electrons with each atom that dissolves. But those electrons go over here, they go through the voltmeter so we can measure their voltage, come through the other side. At the other side, where the copper is, copper ions in solution, here we got the copper ion in solution, is actually being deposited on the cathode as the electrons are being absorbed. So two electrons come in, 
The copper plus two grabs those two electrons, sucks them in, becomes a copper atom, and sticks to the uh, copper cathode. And that reaction happens over and over and over again. At the same time, we should have our anions from this side of the reaction, and the anion would be sulfate moving this way. Anions move towards the anode. And we'd have cations from this side, which would be the zinc ion, moving this way across the salt bridge. And that's necessary to complete the circuit and make sure that we don't get just the charge buildup on both sides. Um, keeps both chambers electrically neutral so it can keep on going. So let me see if I do a positive pole. Where am I? Here? Oh, I'm, I'm looking at the next page already. I will go back to this this page or go back here. Just make one mention here while I'm here. Uh, Articles removed. Articles. One electrode is actually getting smaller and the other one's actually getting bigger over time. Did I get everything on this page for you guys? Yeah. Um, if you follow the electric current through this one, at the zinc anode, the electrons are produced by the oxidation half reaction of zinc going to zinc plus two and producing two electrons. This electrode that pumps out electrons into the external circuit is normally marked as the negative pole. my color coding consistent using a blue for all the oxidations. Where it's oxidized at the anode, you have the negative pole, you're producing electrons of the cell. The electrons generated at the anode must move through the external circuit, the copper wire or the wire uh, to the copper cathode. There they are consumed, reducing copper plus two ions present in the solution around the electrode. The copper plus two goes into copper metal. The copper electrode, which pulls the electrons from the external circuit, is considered to be the positive pole. Of the battery, if you will. As the half reaction proceeds, a surplus of positive zinc plus two ions tends to build up around the zinc electrode. The region around the copper electrode tends to become deficient in positive ions of copper plus two as the copper plus two ions are consumed. To maintain electrical neutrality, cations must move toward the copper cathode and anions to the zinc anode through the salt bridge. In any cell, the negative ions move towards the anode. 
items. One of the things I can do with my soap bridge here, I was going fancy by putting a third chamber in here. I didn't have to do that third chamber. It just minimizes the mixing between these solutions. If I have some kind of neutral salt in between them, I can show you here. I'm going to just go back to my volt meter for a moment, then I'll get your question in hand. Um, if I pull this out for a second, notice that the voltage dies off right away because I don't have a salt bridge in there. Pull this out. As long as I got a salt bridge in there, it's still going to work. I'm right back up where I was. Instead of making the ions go through that middle chamber, now I'm just directly going back and forth between the two, but they're still properly separated. This battery might not last quite as long though as, uh, as it would if I had that center chamber in there. Question. So for the same thing as from the, from the uh, uh, code, is that if you're putting the solution in the rest of the sulfators, they don't get much positive to the cathode? Uh, the zinc, the zinc uh, won't get deposited. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we'll just stay in the solution with the sulfate. Yeah. Um, you can electroplate some other piece of metal, but that's usually when you're forcing it to happen. That gets into that electrolytic cell, um, which is the last thing that we'll study in this chapter. Here's another thing I wanted to show you while I got it uh, set up now. What if I wanted to use this piece of ceramic just to illustrate the same battery taking place? So I got this ceramic cup. I'll put that into a beaker. Temporarily get rid of this. I don't need that anymore. I'm going to put my copper electrode outside that. Put my zinc electrode inside. Stay. Oh, now it's staying. Inside, I'll put the zinc solution in that ceramic container. And outside of it, I will have the copper solution. So now instead of a salt bridge, it's going through a porous material. Still keeping them mostly separated. I think the voltage is going to gradually work its way up because right now it was a dry piece of ceramic. So it's going to take a little while for it to get kind of saturated and for those ions to start to move through it. And once those ions, you know, start moving freely, um, we'll get ourselves back up to our, our 1.1 voltage. So it's going to be a gradual creep up here, but obviously it's going in the right direction there. So that's how you can make your batteries more compact instead of having to have like all these separate vessels. I don't have the patience to wait to 1.1, but it's well on its way. We'll check back at that a little bit later. Actually. Oh, it's almost already there. Crap, I was gonna see it gradually go up, but now it's almost there already. All right, let's go back here. <clears throat> so this is a great first example, just to kind of be familiar with the flow of things, literally, the flow of the electric current. 
This reaction that we're looking at, the zinc copper cell reaction just described is often abbreviated in a certain notation that they use for describing batteries. In this style of representing things, you have the anode on the left, where the electrons are produced, with the cathode on the right. And in this notation, the anode reaction versus the oxidation is shown on the left. The zinc atoms are being oxidized into zinc plus two. The salt bridge or porous disc, whichever I'm using, is indicated by the symbol of this double line, this double vertical line, as the bridge that's separating them. The cathode reaction, a reduction is placed, taking place. It's shown on the right, where copper ions are being reduced to copper atoms. A single vertical line indicates a phase boundary, such as that between a solid electrode and an aqueous solution. So that's the line here between the zinc and the zinc plus two, and also the line between the copper plus two and the copper, a single vertical line to indicate a phase change. Often states in your textbook tends to lean towards this more often than not. Often they'll even put the states in there. So you can see, okay, this is a solid, this is aqueous. We gotta put a single line between them. Um, so that's the way of representing a battery in shorthand indicating what's being oxidized, what's reduced. Maybe putting the states in there and all that. We'll uh, look at some other details because batteries can be a little bit more complicated than just this one, but that's a pretty standard good starting point. We'll see more of those tomorrow. Um, time to talk a little bit about cell potential. Galvanic cell consists of an oxidizing agent where reduction involves gaining in one compartment that pulls electrons through a wire from a reducing agent where the oxidation is taking place. The pull or driving force of the electrons is called the cell potential or E cell. Also known as the electromotive force or EMF of the cell. The unit of electrical potential is the volt, abbreviated as a capital letter B, which is defined as one joule of work per coulomb of charge transferred. Coulombs. Um, volt meter. Can be used to measure the electrical potential of the electrons flow through the wire. So that's what my little electronic thing connected to the computer is acting like it's acting like a voltmeter. Cell potentials will be a big part of tomorrow's topic. We'll be looking at the voltages, like how do you calculate the voltage of a battery just by looking at the reactants. Some other salt bridges or salt bridge cells. The whole thing together, you know, you got a half cell and another half cell and the whole thing together is a electrochemical cell. Many different spontaneous redox reactions can be set up similar to the zinc copper cell just described. Consider for example, the reaction of nickel with copper ions, making nickel ions and copper metal. This reaction can also serve as a source of electrical energy in a voltaic or galvanic cell. The cell is similar to the zinc copper cell, except that the anode, in the anode compartment, a nickel electrode would be surrounded by a solution of nickel two ions, such as nickel chloride or nickel sulfate or nickel nitrate or whatever produces nickel ions. 
In that case, the cell notation would change because this would be the one that's oxidizing, that would be the one reducing. It looks very, very similar though. But when you swap out the uh, different electrodes, you're gonna get a different voltage. So that's one of the things we'll be calculating um, tomorrow. Another spontaneous redox reaction that can take place and serve as a source of electrical energy is that between zinc metal and hydrogen ions. A galvanic cell using this reaction is similar to the zinc copper cell. The zinc goes from zinc to zinc plus two, that's oxidizing. The salt bridge is still the same thing. But since no metal is involved in the cathode half reaction, they have to use an inert electrode. Some kind of metal that is conductive, but doesn't get involved in the reaction itself. A lot of times they use uh, platinum metal. What are they using here? But um, often they'll use something like platinum. Sometimes they'll use graphite because graphite's a good conductor of electricity. They just need a metal that won't react with the reactants on either half cell. Um, gold usually works pretty well too, but nobody can afford it, so they don't use it. So they use an inert electrode that conducts current, frequently made out of platinum. At the uh, cathode in this reaction, hydrogen gas is bubbled, is bubbled, hydrogen gas is bubbled on the cathode, which is surrounded by hydrogen ions in the form of hydrochloric acid solution. So hydrochloric acid is the provider of the hydrogen ions in the solution part. They have some hydrogen gas being bubbled in at the, at the cathode. So you've got the hydrogen gas part of it as well. You got both components, um, both the beginning and the end of the half equation. And uh, of course you got that inert piece of metal because you can't connect an electrode to hydrogen ions or hydrogen gas. So you need an inert piece of metal to conduct that. Um, everything going on at this side, is still the same as business as usual. You got the solid, you got the zinc ions, electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode. It's just that over here, when the uh, hydrogen gains an electron through the wire from coming from the other side, it's gonna uh, combine to form hydrogen gas and basically leave the reaction that way. In this particular case, when we look at the battery that you would draw, the shorthand, zinc and zinc ions over here on the left, um, they're in a different phase. One's a solid, one's aqueous. So we've got the single vertical line here. That's your anode. We'll have a salt bridge taking place between the two, two vertical lines. We got hydrogen going to hydrogen gas. So that's normal, uh, different phases. So we got the single line over here. But then the uh, cathode. But then because we're using an external um, or an inert piece of metal in place of the hydrogen or the hydrogen gas, we indicate what that electrode is, what metal that electrode is, in this case, platinum. And uh, we indicate the state of that, separate that by another line, just showing all the things going on at the cathode side of the reaction there as well. So it adds a little bit more complexity to the uh, shorthand diagram. But always anode on the left, cathode on the right. Uh, to summarize before we go to the last page of the day, a galvanic voltaic cell consists of two half cells. They're joined by an external electric circuit through which electrons move and a cell bridge through which ions move. Each half cell consists of an elect 
electrode dipped into a water solution. If a metal participates in the cell reaction, either as a reactant or a product, it is ordinarily used as the electrode. Otherwise, an inert electrode such as platinum is used. In one half cell, oxidation occurs at the anode. In the other half cell, reduction takes place at the cathode. The overall reaction is the sum of the half reactions taking place at the anode and the cathode. We spend most of our time in this chapter looking at the half cells almost like individually. We don't necessarily spend a lot of time looking at them combined together. We're not really worrying about balancing redox reactions as much as just understanding what's going on in the two half cells. So balancing equation wise, this is an easier chapter. Just want to take you through one last example today, just to see that we can kind of summarize a little bit of what's going on here and label a few things, get you thinking about this. When chlorine gas is bubbling through a water solution of sodium bromide, a spontaneous reaction occurs. Obviously, we get our bearings, diatomic chlorine. Chlorines have a zero charge there, because that's the naturally occurring state. It's got a negative one over here. Diatomic bromine also is zero. So the bromine, negative one up to zero, that's an increase, that's your oxidation. Zero down to negative one, that's going down, that's your reduction. So we got a redox reaction taking place and it's already balanced for us and all that good stuff. This uh, reaction can serve as a source of electrical energy in the voltaic, voltaic cell shown below. Um, in this case, because we've got gases and aqueous solutions and liquids, we don't have any metals, they're using a platinum electrode in both cases. Um, on this side, we've got liquid bromine and bromine ions. On this side, we've got chlorine gas and chlorine ions. And because we got the gas, they're doing that whole thing where they're pumping in some gas into the electrode as well. Still need a salt bridge. We get a different voltage because we have a uh, two different half cells that have different cell potentials. What we want to first do is label what the cathode half reaction is and what the anode half reaction is. So we can do that just looking at this information. Just break it up into the oxidation half cell and the reduction half cell. At the cathode, where the uh, reduction is taking place, we have Cl2 gas gaining two electrons, make two chlorine ions solution. So that's the reduction part. At the Anode half reaction, we've got two bromines that are in solution, negative one, producing bromine diatomic, which is a liquid, and two electrons there. So the bromine's producing the electrons, the chlorine's gaining the electrons. We got that. Which way do the electrons move in the external circuit through the wire? Well, they're being produced at the anode and they're being pulled towards the cathode. So the electrons are going this way. This turns out to be the Um, I was right back here, anode. Color code that. Which way do the anions move within the cell? And which way do the cations move? 
So the anions move to the anode. The chlorine ions, for example, here would move over towards the anode. And the cations, now if you look at this, Br2, that's not a cation. Br negative one, that's not a cation. Where's the cation? Well, where did the bromine come from? It came from sodium bromide. So there's going to still be something that delivered the, the bromine ions into the solution. It's the sodium bromide. It's just a spectator ion for the most part, but it does help balance the charges. So that's the ions can move the other way. So anions to the anode. We're not figuring out voltages yet. That's tomorrow's thing. Being able to look at the half cells and be able to figure out the voltage. And uh, we'll look at cell potentials and how we calculate those tomorrow. It's actually a pretty easy calculation you can add. Um, the best to do it is our introduction to electrochemistry. And that, I never answered your question from before. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the electrolysis part of it. Thank you. 